the goal for week 12 um, is to go over chapter 9 and originally in the syllabus I wanted to well I, I listed all six sections of chapter 9 um, significance test about hypotheses and into week 12 um, in this in this week we will go over chapter 9 um, statistical inference the so second method significance test about hypothesis um, originally in the syllabus I listed all six sections um, I was gonna do spend two weeks on it but with us having about well we do only have time for one week now we only have one week to cover chapter nine so what I'm going to do is you probably saw that homework my math lab homework is not open yet because I didn't know how far I could go in the next three hours. Okay, our class is regularly um, three hours. So I'm going to record about three hours worth of lesson, uh, lecture. And then I'll stop. And then I'll open up the homework problems. Uh, definitely probably 9, 1 through 9, 4. Um, but I, I'm not sure if I can finish 9, 5, and 9, 6 in that three hours. So I'll do... Um, that I'll go ahead and open up the homework uh, for this week by this afternoon, this evening. And I know that you guys work on your homework. Um, like some some of you kind of finish it on Friday, finish everything on Friday. But um, I'll try to. Le I'm I'm gonna leave your homework for week twelve open until next Friday instead of next Thursday, so that you have one more day to finish it. Because since I'm I'm not opening it um, this morning at 11. I'm opening it probably later this afternoon. Okay, so that's why the homework is not open yet. But I'm going to go over 9, 1 through 9, 4 definitely. And then I'll see if I can cover 9, 5, and 9, 6. Okay, so that's why the homework's not open because I may not be able to finish everything. In that case, I want to be able to remove some of those questions before you guys start on it. Alrighty, so on the on Canvas, you will see the first lesson, 9.1. I'm going to go through 9.1 um, in this video. Steps for performing a significance test. I'm just going to go over the steps, five steps. But I'm not really going to do a hypo hypothesis test here. I'm not going to do a significance test in this lesson. Uh, we're doing that in 9.2 and 9.3. Okay, so just a little introduction to what hypothesis or significance test is. And some of the important terms like null hypothesis or alternative hypothesis, we'll go over those and how to tell which one is null and which one is hypothesis, um, alternative. And talk about what p-value is. That's, that's pretty much it. But this one, we're not going to actually do a significance test. Just going to go over what it is. Okay. Alrighty, let's present this slide and the notes that goes with it. Let's see. I did post it. Um... Is also up here for you. Make a couple of these fill-ins. Um, got what? Three, four pages. Yeah, four pages. Alrighty. So you're ready. Let's start nine point one. Let me see. Because I like this animation feature when I click on enter or click with the mouse, it shows one paragraph at a time. Huh? I don't know if I added all those. Let me just do that real quick before I start this with you. Now, I want to finish everything in 245, and I think we'll be able to, but at the same time, I do not want to overwhelm you. See what I mean? So if you feel like the information that I'm giving is, I think last week was all right. We just did four sections. That's how much we will do regularly in a regular three-hour class period. But if you think this week is... Uh, like I said, I'll just stop after recording about three hours worth. Okay. So animation should be good. Alrighty, let me start. Thank you for your patience. Um, present. So five steps for performing a significance test. Remember we said we're going to look at two different methods of statistical inference. The first one, in chapter eight, we went over constructing confidence interval. Now chapter nine, we're going to look at Performing significance test or hypothesis test. I call it differently. All right, but what do we mean by hypothesis? In statistics, a hypothesis is a statement about a population, usually claiming that a population parameter takes a particular numerical value 
or falls in a certain range of values. Um, we're gonna have a difference, uh, different hypothesis when it takes a particular single value versus when it takes a range of values. We're gonna look at two different types of hypothesis, but they're talking about population parameter. Okay. Um, so, example. In an advertisement, a pizza shop claims that the mean delivery time is less than, or less, you know, it would be nice to just say, the mean delivery time is, I'll change that, is 30 minutes. I'll say that. Because they said average, right? Then the mean is about 30 minutes. And, you know, I started using these food delivery uh, a little more nowadays. The other day, I had to wait, what, 45 minutes for my Panda Express. So when my food comes late, I start to, you know, wonder about these claims. The pizza shop said that the mean delivery time is 30 minutes. But what if my pizza arrived 45 minutes? So I'm going to do a test. I'm going to do a statistical significance test to, to show that their mean delivery time is not really less than or about 30 minutes. So I'll fix that part too. I, I, I just want to keep it as a singular va uh, value. It's really, it's not really 30 minutes. Okay. I just it really, I just want to do that. Okay. Um, and if it is not 30 minutes, what do I believe, do you think? If they say, oh, it's about 30 minute delivery and my food arrived 45 in, in 45 minutes, what I believe, guys, what I assume is that their delivery time is not really 30 minutes, but actually longer. That's what I believe, right? So this kind when you when you get an observation that um, kind of makes us wonder about the claim about the population parameter, then we start Getting these assumptions about something else, you know? Well, something else. Um, another one. Traditionally, about 70% of students in a particular statistics course are successful. Traditionally, that's what they are claiming, right? About 70% of students are successful. Well, let's see. We got an example. We got a sample, suppose. If only 12 students in a class of 30 randomly selected students are successful, now, real quick, what is the observed p hat here? What is the observed sample proportion in this case? Do that real quick for me. 12 divided by 30, right? 12 were successful out of 30 chosen. So that chance, well, that proportion is really 0 0.4, 40%. Now, let's say that the university was claiming about 70% are successful, but then I got a, a an observation that where I got only 40% were successful. You see that I'm starting to have, you know, doubts about or like assumptions, certain assumptions about the, this claim. So is there enough evidence that students of that particular instructor are successful at a rate less than 70%? You see why I'm believing or kind of thinking it may be less than 70, right? Because the number that I got was 40% and that was much less than 70%. Now, the first example, the pizza delivery example, my assumption it was that it's greater than 30 minutes because my observation was 45 minutes longer. Now, in my second example, I'm believing um, that the alternative may be really less than 70% since I saw something like 40% success rate in this one uh, instructor's class. So, kind of just kind of showing you uh, when we are writing these hypotheses later, uh, what we read, uh, what we observe, is going to help us form the alternative hypothesis. And um, forming alternative hypothesis, we're going to have to just be a little careful about the direction. Like, we're going to be using inequality symbols. And for the first example, my alternative will be, hey, the mean is greater than 30. You see, because I saw something like 45 minutes. And my second example, my alternative hypothesis will be like, hey, P must be smaller than 70% because I got something like 40%. You see, um, that's what we're going to be doing. I think I'm going way too much on this right now, but let's, let's go on with the slides. So significance test. It's a method for using data, using data to summarize the evidence about a hypothesis. 
we're going to try to gather some evidence. And what we're going to do is we're going to find the number probability. We're going to find something called the p-value. And that's going to be my, our evidence to say something of our hypothesis. And what we want to do is we want to either, uh, we want to actually reject this null hypothesis. We want to say, hey, it's not really 30 minute delivery time. Or hey, it's not really 70% success rate. That's what we want to do. Because we, we got this idea that they're not really what they claim to be, right? All right. Before conducting a hypothesis test, we identify the variable measured and the population parameter of interest. In the pizza example, it was mean, right? Um, and in the, 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 the success rate in a stats class, that was a proportion. So for categorical variables, the parameter is typically a proportion. And for quantitative variable, the parameter is typically the average or mean, okay? So in section 9.2, we're going to do a significance test for proportions. And section 9.3, we're going to do the same type. I mean, it's a significance test for mean. Okay, So they're two different tests. And, um, and in chapter 10, we do more tests with more different things. But that's the plan for 9.2 and 9.3 that I definitely want to go over this week with you. And 9.4 is also fun because 9.4 will look at type of errors in a significance test. Just like how we can make a mistake in our test, um, we may make errors um, in our significance test. So something like type 1 error, we're going to call it, really there are two types of errors in the significance test. Type 1 error will be something like this, telling this gentleman, sir, you are pregnant. You know that's wrong, right? So that's, that's a, um, this is an example of type 1 error. We'll get more into it in section 9.4. But, you know, there's a slightly different type of errors going on in type 2 error. Take a look. This very pregnant-looking lady, and the doctor is saying, hey, you're not pregnant. Well, there's a problem in that one too, right? But you see how these two are two different types of errors? We'll talk about types of errors in significance tests in section 9.4, and that is definitely something that I want to cover today too. 9.5 and 9.6, um, they're fun to talk about, but if I have to skip them this week, and just open up assignments on 9, 1 through 9, 4. I may have to do that uh, to just keep it as three hours long because I, 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 I cannot overwhelm you with you guys having your final exams and projects in other classes too with everything going on. So I really appreciate if you email me and uh, let me know uh, how you're doing. Uh, I haven't heard from our class yet, but some of my calculus students are um, expressing that the workload is, 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 is very stressful, but you know, you let me know. Um, and I try to be very reasonable and try to be flexible with everything going on. All right, so let's talk about five steps of a significance test for the rest of this lesson. Five steps. First, assumption. We did that already, right? We could have, you know, we heard a claim like, hey, our delivery time average is 30 minutes, but when my pizza arrived 15 minutes later than what they said, I started having this, you know, second thoughts about, you sure? Um, second one, based on those assumptions, we are going to be uh, writing some hypothesis. Okay? And we're going to be writing two hypotheses for each hypothesis testing. So um, for me, I mean, there are five steps, but three are absolutely, and three of them are very, very important. Uh, I think hypothesis is very important, so I highlighted that. Number three is called test statistics. We can do this. Uh, test statistics will be calculated using standard error, and that's the, the little mathy part that we will do. Of course, we will do some by hand, but we will also use technology in stat crunch. So test statistic is important, but um, when we are using technology, um, that's not as important as, I guess, the p-value that you're going to report in your um, conclusion. So write down step four is uh, finding the p-value, p-value, and we'll talk about what that is in step four. And lastly, we're going to make conclusion. I think for me, that is the most important part. We did all this study. We did all this test. We should be able to make a conclusion, and we should be able to explain this in a plain language, plain English, so that somebody understands uh, the significance of our study. Like, what's the result? Like, do I have evidence to believe that the mean pizza delivery time is not 30 minutes? Something like that. So step one, assumptions. Very simple. You read, I mean, you hear about the 
the uh, population parameter, you hear a certain claim, and then you notice something else. Like you have a single observation that makes you believe otherwise. Hypotheses are our assumptions about the data, which may or may not be true. Hey, maybe that success rate is not really seventy percent. Maybe it is less than seventy percent. So you can make a hypothesis if you use your imagination. I mean, if you believe everything they say about the population parameter, you believe every claim. There were there's no reason for us to do a hypothesis testing. Okay. But what we are assuming is that hey, that claim they're making may or may not be true. So I'm gonna go and test it. That's step number one. Now, based on that assumption, what we're gonna do is we're gonna form how many two hypotheses. Now, I want see. Hold on. Sometimes you know I don't want this to just show up at once. Give me one second, guys. See, I thought I am very good with this uh, Google slides and this presentation, but I'm still having issues. Anyways, let me let me see. I'm gonna go ahead and click on this, add animation, and then I'll say by paragraph, so that we can see one paragraph at a time. Okay. All right. So let me start back. Sorry. Uh, hypothesis. That's plural, right? When they say hypothesis, like with the e's, this is plural. Um, each significance test has how many? Two hypotheses about a population parameter. You must have two hypotheses written down when you are doing these significance, not just one. But you must have two, and those two are the first one is the null hypothesis, uh, null hypothesis, and the second one is called alternative hypothesis. And these, when when they spell it this way with s i s, these are singular. So you need both of them. You need both null and alternative hypothesis for a sing for one significance test. So you're gonna write them, and we will talk about symbols now. Uh, take a look at this first symbol H with a little circle as a subscript. Um, this we I read it as H not. Some people read it as H zero, but H not or H zero denotes the null hypothesis and the symbol. I I've always heard H A. Yeah, I call it H A. I read it H A. H A. Um, this is a symbol for alternative hypothesis. Okay, there's no H N. This is H not. For null and H A for alternative. Okay, so look at the symbols. We're not going to be spending time writing null hypothesis or alternative hypothesis every time. We're going to use symbols now. Okay. Now, well, important thing. Um, you formulate these hypotheses, both of these hypotheses for a significance test before viewing or analyzing the data. So what you're going to do is you get some kind of uh, like you, you you get an assumption based on a single observation. I don't think what they are claiming is true. So you kind of write your hypotheses and you go on with your test and you analyze your data. That's the way to do. You cannot say, "Hey, I've been doing some number crunch. I've done some numbers, and it looks like I need to go back and fix my hypothesis." You can't do that. So you set these hypotheses before you run your numbers or before you analyze the data, and then those are set. Okay, you cannot say, "Oh, I think I'm gonna fail to reject my null at this rate. I better go and change." It. We, we can't do that. Okay, so you set these hypotheses before viewing or analyzing the data. Okay, all right. Let's talk more about null hypothesis, the H not or H zero. The null hypothesis is a statement that the parameter takes a particular value. I highlighted the word particular, and there's another word that I that I highlighted that I created a blank for you. What I mean by particular value is something like this: the mean average pizza delivery time is is thirty minutes, or the success rate in a stats class is point seventy. That is a particular value, right? Um, here you go. The symbol again.、Uh, the H not the null hypothesis. We read that as H zero or H not N A U G H T H not.、Um, <laughs> the null hypothesis is a has a single parameter value. The particular single parameter value. So when you write null hypothesis, guys, you better have an equal sign in it. Yeah, you need to have an equal sign in it. Okay, something like this. The mean is thirty. Where is thirty from? It's a thirty-minute delivery time, right? The average is thirty. Mean population mean is thirty, and that mu is a symbol for population mean, right? All right. Another H naught for my other example is that 
the proportion, the population proportion is 0.70. That's what they claim, right? So these are how you can write null hypothesis. With the symbol, and in our class, it's always going to be mu equals or p equals, okay? Mu for population mean and p, little p, for population proportion. Never put x bar or p hat when you're writing null hypothesis. We are assuming that these are the population parameters in our null hypothesis, okay? Now, what about the alternative hypothesis? Remember, the nulls are the one with the equal signs. The alternatives are our assumptions, really, what we want to go and believe. Now, alternative hypothesis states that the parameter falls in an alternative range of values. This is not a single particular value, but a range of value. So something like not 30, or greater than 30, or less than 30, not 0.70, but maybe like greater than 70, or less than 70, or just either way. So um, here's a symbol for you, HA, the alternative hypothesis, you read it as HA. We talked about that already. Not HADO, HA. An alternative hypothesis has a range of values. That's important, so I highlighted that both a value that are alternative to the one in H0. So here's an example. The alternative hypothesis is that the mean delivery time for the, this population is actually greater than 30. And remember, I had a reason to believe that, right? I kind of had a, uh, like, I had a very good reason to kind of set that as my alternative. It wouldn't make sense to say less than 30. Well, if they claim the mean delivery is 30 minutes and I got my pizza in two seconds, then I will believe, like, oh, it must be less than 30 minutes. But my pizza came too late for me, 15 minutes late. So I will say, hey, I think the alternative is really greater than 30 minutes. So I, we're still, look at the symbol for me, we're still uh, using the symbols for population parameter. I'm saying the population mean is greater than 30. Now what's the other one? Um, for the other one, where we had a single observation where a professor, uh, like a certain instructor had only 12 out of 30 students successful. So that was less, that was about 40%, less than 70% that um, I guess this university claims. So I kind of have a reason to believe that the maybe the true population proportion is less than 0.70. Notice, based on what you see, based on your observation, initial observation or your assumption, you know, the inequalities in your alternative hypothesis will change. But if there's no suggested direction, there's no reason to believe that uh, it's greater than or less than, we may still be able to write an alternative hypothesis this way. Hey, maybe this is just not a fair coin. I, I, I don't know if it's, uh, more, it's giving me more head or more tails, but I just know it's not fair. So we may say that the proportion is just not 50, 0.50, but it may be greater than or maybe less than. But third one is also a range, right? Because the third one is talking about anything from 0 to um. 0.499999, like smaller than 0.50, and anything greater than uh, 0.51, uh, 52, like uh, 1. So all these three, we, we're going to use either inequality symbols, like greater than or less than, or a not equal to sign to write the alternative hypothesis. So here's the difference, right? For the null hypothesis, you use the equal sign. Alternative, you're going to give them the range. Okay, so let's look at two examples together. Is a statement a null hypothesis or an alternative hypothesis? Here's the first one for you. The proportion of adults who favor legalized gambling equals 0.80. What's the keyword here? Equals, right? Equals. That's going to be, well, we're taking a particular single value of 0.80. So call that a null hypothesis. Now, let's try to write this in symbols. Remember, when you're running or when you are setting up your hypothesis test, when you're starting your test, you better give them two hypotheses, right? So we know the null is p equals 0.80. Now, is there a reason to believe that it is higher than 80 or lower than 0.80? They really didn't give us that uh, direction in this sentence, right? They just said null. So you know what I'm going to do is that in notation, the h naught, the null hypothesis is what they gave us, p equals 0.80. The alternative will just, we're going to say, hey, P is not 0.80. It's the opposite, right? Um, 
If I had an observation, something like, well, I interviewed 100 people, and out of 100 people, nobody favored legalized gambling, well, then I have a very good reason to set my alternative hypothesis as P is less than 0.80, but since they didn't say anything like that, the alternative will simply be P not equal to 0.80. Let's look at another one. Uh, what about this one? The proportion of all college students who are, who are regular smokers is less than 0.27. Is that a particular single, single value or is that a range they're giving you? This is a range because less than 0.27 means anything smaller than 0.27, right? So this is a alternative hypothesis. So how would you, I mean, we do know the alternative. HA is P less than 0.27. How would you write the null hypothesis that goes with it? Remember, Null has to take a singular particular value, so we're going to just use that number 0.27 and say our H0 is P equals 0.27, and the alternative is P is less than 0.27. All right, I, hopefully, I hope these are okay with you so far. All right, so let's talk about what we are going to do in a hypothesis test with these hypotheses. Null hypothesis is presumed to be true, unless data give strong evidence against it. So what we are doing in hypothesis testing, guys, or significance test, I'll just call it test from now on. When, when we do these tests, what we want is we want to get a strong evidence to reject the null. We want to get a strong evidence to prove that null hypothesis must be false. And then if the null is false, then I must have a good reason to believe the alternative, right? So that's what we want to do. Well, we want to use the data to give strong evidence against the null hypothesis. So courtroom provides an analog, analog, I have difficult time reading these words, for significance test. Um, so take a look. The H0, the null hypothesis in a courtroom is that the defendant is innocent, right? We assume that this person is innocent until what? Until he is proven guilty. So HA, the alternative is that the defendant is guilty. Or in other words, not innocent, I guess. Um, so the jury presumes H not is true. So what does that mean? The jury presumes that the defendant is innocent. That's what we believe. Unless there is a strong evidence, and in our case, we're going to be using data, that's suggesting otherwise, otherwise being like guilty. So the jury presumes the defendant is innocent unless the prosecutor can provide strong evidence that the defendant is guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. It's very similar in hypothesis testing. What we're going to do is we're not going to have evidence, but we're going to have data to get a p-value. And based on that strong p-value, what we're going to say is, hey, I don't think this H0 is true. I must believe the HA, the alternative, that our null is guilty or our null is, I should say, the null is not true. We're going to reject the, the null hypothesis and believe the alternative. So um, what's considered a strong evidence in our test? Well, we first have to do some math and um, something called find we're going to have to find something called test statistic. And I'll open these up because we're not really going to find test statistic in section 9.1. We'll do that in 9.2 and 9.3. Um, a parameter to which hypothesis refer has a point estimate, right? We have a point estimate right in the middle. And a test statistic describes how far that point estimate falls from the parameter value given in the null hypothesis. Okay? Usually, uh, measured by the number of standard error between the point estimate and the parameter. And we'll actually do this more in 9.2 and 9.3, but I just wanted to have you ha for you to have these in your notes. Um, but remember, we use this guy called standard error when we constructed confidence interval in chapter 8. And this guy's back. We're going to do some math uh, for test statistics. And, you know, it describes how far that point estimate falls uh, from the parameter value given in null hypothesis. But we'll do more of this mathy part when we actually do a significance test. But step three is to find this test statistic. Now, step four is very important. 
p-value. This is your evidence. This is going to be the evidence that will help us reject an all or fail to reject an all. So p-value is what you're going to have to report. p-value is the probability that the test statistic equals the observed or a value even more extreme. Something like, what's the chance that I see 45 minutes or even longer delivery time? And that's, that's what p-value is. That's the probability that something equal to the observed value or even more extreme. So in my second example about successful, you know, students in the stats class, you know, um, the p-value will be the probability that the test statistic equals 0.40 or even more extreme in this case being more smaller than 0.40 right um, it is calculated by presuming that the null hypothesis h naught is true now for me i mean it, i don't think it may it's gonna make much um it's, it's, you may not really understand it completely until we actually do an example but uh, just kind of want you to you know hear these words before we actually go in and do it test statistic is what we find and then we find p-value, which is the probability that such test statistic will equal the observed or even more extreme value. And this is all done uh, first by assuming or presuming that the null hypothesis H0 is true. Okay. So throughout um, this significance test, what we're going to always assume is we're going to believe that H0 is true. We're going to believe that H0 is true and say if that H0 is true, what's the chance no, what's the chance that such extreme value may ha happen out of chance? We're going to find the probability. Uh, the p-value is a tail probability, maybe to the left extreme or to the right extreme, uh, beyond the observed test statistic value if the presumed h naught is true. And I got a picture, a nice picture that goes with this in the very next slide, so we'll take a look at that. A smaller p-value, so this one is important, so I do want you to highlight this. Smaller p-value provide stronger evidence against the null hypothesis and that is what we want if our significance test goes well we want to see a small p-value usually we want it less than 0 0.05 point zero five is a popular alpha level that we're going to talk about and we want it to be small like we want that chance to be like one percent two percent three percent four percent maybe like five percent we want that p-value to be small um so that they can provide a strong evidence against the null hypothesis. Okay, so that part is important, and remember that. Um, so here we go. So what's the chance of something, uh, what's the chance of having something in this blue area? As you go more and more to the right side, to the more extreme side, you see that chance or that area is going to get smaller, right? So smaller p-value provides stronger evidence to reject the null hypothesis. All right, figure 9.1. Suppose H0 were true, H0 were true. Um, the p-value is the probability of a test statistic value, like the observed one or even more extreme, like this one or maybe to the right side of it, okay? And this is assuming, um, I, this is the alternative, you know, kind of assuming that it is greater than the, the claimed null, right? So, uh, this is the shaded area and the tail of the sampling distribution, and the p-value is going to be really the area under this uh, the shaded region. Um, so here's a question. Which gives stronger evidence against the null hypothesis? A p-value of 0.20 or a p-value of 0 0.01? Now remember, smaller the p-value, the stronger the evidence. Smaller the p-value, the stronger the evidence, because... What we are saying is the chance of this happening by just chance is so small. It must be statistically significant. So we want the p-value to be small to have a strong evidence against the null hypothesis. So after finding the p-value, in your conclusion, you must include that p-value. Report the p-value in the conclusion, and we're going to write a sentence interpreting what it says about the question that motivated the test. And we'll do all that fun part in 9.2 and 9.3.
For instance, based on the p-value, that could come out to be 0 0.2, 0 0.3, I'm sorry, 0 0.02, 0 0.03, 2 percent, 3 percent. We want something less than 5 percent, typically. We can reject H0 and conclude that the mean pizza delivery time is actually greater than 30 minutes. Once you reject your H0, you're going to go and believe your alternative. Um, we, do, we get to do that when p-value is very small, such as 0 0.05 or less, okay? Um, I got two, you know, two uh, great gentlemen explaining um, this p-value business in a little more. When the p-value is low, when p is low, reject the, not the whole, but reject the h naught. okay? So, remember this, we'll do this in 9.2 and 9.3. When you get a small p-value, less than a, your set alpha level, typically 0 0.05, we're going to reject the h naught, And that is really what we want to do in a hypothesis test, okay? We want the small p-value so that we can reject the alternative, uh, re reject the null hypothesis and go with our alternative hypothesis based on our assumption, right? Now, what if the p-value comes out greater than your set alpha level of, say, so like very common one is 0 0.05? If your p-value comes out to be greater than 0, 0 0.05 typically, well, then we are going to say we fail to reject the null. We fail to reject the null. And we don't want to say we accept the null, okay? Like, we may fail to um, reject a defendant is innocent. And I'm not going to go there. I think I'm going to confuse myself by saying uh, things. But uh, either you reject the, the null hypothesis or you fail to reject the null hypothesis. Those are the two conclusions in, in every, every um, um, what's it say, hypothesis test, okay? So that was a little preview of our chapter 9. We will be back and actually do these tests in 9.2 and 9.3 and talk about errors in 9.4 this week, okay? Uh, that was about 36 minutes. So I better use my time very wisely because I don't want to go longer than three hours um, for each week's lesson. All right, I'll be back later.